Mr. President. The Senator from Oregon. Mr. President, climate disruption is the seminal challenge of our generation. It is the most significant test that human civilization on our planet has faced. And there's a lot of questions about how we're going to be able to come together as a community of nations, community of cultures, to address this very significant threat to our beautiful blue-green planet. It affects everything from our farms to our forests to our fisheries. We see the impact in terms of disappearing glaciers and, and shrinking ice sheets and melting permafrost and dying coral. And we see the impact on our farms and our trout streams and our forests. We see the impact with migrating animals and migrating insects and certainly more powerful storms. In response, communities across the globe are taking action. They're transforming their energy economies. They're developing aggressive strategies to save energy in their buildings and in their vehicles and in their appliances. And they're working to replace their fossil fuel energy supplies with renewable, clean and renewable energy. How much do you know about the changes underway? Let's find out. Welcome to episode three of the Senate Climate Disruption Quiz. First question we have, why did American Airlines cancel 57 flights between June 20th and 22nd? Was it extreme temperatures? Was it a pilot strike? Was it severe storms? Was it a fuel shortage? The answer is A, extreme temperatures. Well, how is that the case? When air gets hotter, it gets thinner, and thinner air provides less lift for planes to take off. And eventually, the, the runway just isn't long enough for the plane to go fast enough to get enough lift to clear the runway. And so, therefore, all of these flights get canceled. Not the first time it's happened. It happened in 2013 in Phoenix with 18 flights canceled. But this was a pretty dramatic incident attributable, attributable to very extreme temperatures. Let's turn to question two. How long was the recent streak of record-setting monthly temperatures? Meaning, for example, that a given month like May was the hottest May ever, and June was the hottest June ever and July was the hottest July ever. How many months in a row did this happen? Did it happen for six months in a row? Or for 12 months in a row? Is it conceivable that this streak extended beyond a year to 16 months? Or perhaps even for two years to 24 months? Lock in your answers. The correct answer is C, 16 months. From May 2015 through August of 2016, each and every month was the hottest month on record. And in September 2016, the streak was broken, but only by a few hundredths of a degree. In fact, in September 2016, the temperature was still 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit above the 20th century average. Now I have a little math question to put in here. If you had climate data, temperature data, for 50 years, what are the odds that by chance 16 months in a row would be the hottest? Each one, the hottest among the 50 previous months. What are the odds of that? Well, pull out your calculators and take one out of 50, and take it to the 16th power, and what do you get? You get the odds are less than one out of a trillion trillion. That's the odds. In other words, this didn't happen by chance. 
Let's turn to question number three. Where in the world is the largest floating solar project? Maybe you've never even heard of a floating solar project. But there is one. In fact, there are several. Where is the world's largest? Is it in China? Is it in Brazil? Is it in India? Or is it in Australia? And by way, here is a hint. All four of these actually have floating solar projects. Lock in your answer. And here is the answer. The answer is A, China. Now, India has a small, let's get A marked. India has a small floating solar project, generates about 100 kilowatts. Australia's is 40 times larger at 4 megawatts, roughly the equivalent of two wind turbines. Brazil, yet larger at 10 megawatts. But the largest floating solar project by far is in Lulong, China. 40 megawatt solar plant, able to provide enough energy to power 15,000 homes. And because it floats, it uses less energy than most solar farms because the water acts as a natural coolant. But there's something very symbolic about this largest in the world floating solar project, and that is that it sits on a lake caused by the collapse of abandoned coal mines, as if it's saying to us, Let's transition from fossil fuel economy to a clean, renewable energy economy like electrons produced by solar power. Question number four. Last year, plug-in hybrid and fully electric vehicles made up less than 1% of global car sales. Very small amount. What was the percentage in Norway? Was it half a percent? Behind the world average, 15%? Was it 37%? Or perhaps even more than one out of two cars sold in Norway? Lock in your answers. Here is the right answer. The answer is C, 37%. When the world average is under 1%, pretty impressive that Norway is at 37%. In 2016, plug-in hybrids and fully electric cars made up 30%, 37% of the new car sales in Norway. And that's a huge increase over just a couple years. Three years earlier, the electric vehicles, the plug-in hybrids and fully electric, accounted for only 6% of Norway's sales. So, in a short three years, it went from 6% to 37%. This growth is a combination of fees on gas and diesel-powered cars and subsidies for electric vehicles. And let's look at what else is happening with cars in the world. Volvo has announced that all of its new models from 2019 forward will have some form of electric drive. And then you see the, the growth of companies like Tesla that only produces electric cars. And it is becoming increasingly clear that the future of the global auto industry is electric. Let's turn to question number five, our final question. And this one hits close to home for me as a senator from Oregon. What killed billions of baby oysters in Oregon in 2007 and 2008? Was it red tide? Red tide occurs when an algae blooms, and it's a red bloom. It discolors the, the water, turns it red, and it releases toxins that are absorbed by the clams and other sea life so that you know, we can't go out and dig up our clams and eat them for fear of getting poisoned. Was it red tide that killed the oysters? Or was it the POMS virus, the Pacific Oyster Mortality Syndrome, which affects Pacific oysters and can cause up to 100% mortality within days of initial detection? Was it sea lice, tiny jellyfish larvae that are tiny, almost invisible specks, no larger than a grain of pepper? 
Or was it rising ocean acidity caused by the emission of billions of tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the air and then absorbed by the ocean through tidal action? Lock in your answer. The correct answer is D, rising ocean acidity. How is this possible? How can you stand on the coast of Oregon and look out at the Pacific Ocean and envision that humankind has burned so much fossil fuels, so many fossil fuels, so much, that it has created so much carbon dioxide in the air and tidal action has absorbed that into the ocean and turned it into carbonic acid, that it's changed the acidity of the ocean. It seems completely impossible. And yet, over the last 150 years, the burning of, of fossil fuels by human civilization has increased the acidity of the ocean by 30%. So in 2007, when I was running for the US Senate for the first time, the oysters started dying. And the scientists got involved. They said, what's going on? They said, it is, a, is it a virus? Is it a bacterium? It wasn't a virus. It wasn't a bacterium. And after some time, they nailed it down simply that the ocean water had become too acidic, too much carbonic acid in the ocean from carbon dioxide pollution in the atmosphere. And where did that come from? From the burning of fossil fuels. So now, the water comes into the Whiskey Creek oyster hatchery in a very large pipe, and then it has to be buffered. That is, the acidity has to be decreased before that water continues into the vats with the baby oysters. And for all we know, they'll have to do this forever more until we can turn the clock back on global climate disruption. And if the oysters are being affected, what else is going to be affected in the sea chain? What is the impact on our coral reefs, which provide the foundation for many of the world's fisheries. Well, that's something that we should rightly be very concerned about. So there you have it, folks. Episode three of the Senate Climate Disruption Quiz. How did you do? How many of those questions did you get right? Facts on the ground are changing very quickly as climate disruption increases and communities across, across the globe respond. Together, we are racing the clock. And there is no time to spare. So stay engaged in the fight. In the near future, I'll bring you episode four of the Senate Climate Disruption Quiz. And in the meantime, if you have a good idea for climate disruption question, please tweet that question to me at send Jeff Merkley with hashtag climate Q for Jeff. Together, let's keep fighting to save our planet. Henry David Thoreau said, what use is a home if you don't have a tolerable planet to put it on? Let's work together to make sure that we have a tolerable planet, a healthy planet, not just for this generation, but for our children and great-grandchildren and generations to follow.